Well, if sartorial choices would determine what our next topic is, then David is rightly dressed. Red hat and a little blue inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, David Levine, it's my very pleasure to introduce him. He serves as Red Hat's Vice President and Assistant General Counsel with responsibility for the Products, Technology, and Open Source Legal Group. This is a very long bio, and that's going to be true for almost everybody who's going to speak because you are very accomplished, and that's why you are here to talk. But um, um, Dave, David is responsible for managing the full range of legal responsibilities associated with Red Hat's product and service offerings and business models, licensing of open source software, the creation and maintenance of Red Hat's standard contract terms, and administering Red Hat's anti-corruption compliance program. Rest of it you can read here. And he's going to talk about the GPL cooperation and commitment, because that's one part of how we have reached this new consensus, where, which has been made possible by several developments, by a variety of efforts by different parties. So here is David Levine. Thanks, Mishi. So as, so as Mishi said, I uh, wore my uh, sort of my blue underneath and my red on top. You know, as you probably read uh, earlier this week, uh, Red Hat and IBM signed an acquisition agreement. Uh, but the idea is that Red Hat will continue, you know, while we'll be blue underneath, we'll be sort of red on the outside because we're going to continue to be operated independently. So um, so very interesting news for, uh, for the open source world. Uh, we're still digesting it, but uh, uh, so more to come. But I think, uh, yeah, definitely very impactful. So Evan and me, she asked me to talk about our work with the GPL cooperation commitment. But I wanted to do is maybe put this into broader context and to sort of talk about what this means and, and what it really is, because I think there's sort of a broader uh, message here. And so what I want to do is sort of combine three presentations. So one was the presentation that Richard and I gave last year about uh, FOSS licenses as shared resources. The second, uh, I want to pick up on a presentation that McCoy Smith from Intel gave the Linux Foundation Member Council event last month. And, um, and third, you know, draw upon a number of presentations I've given around the, um, the GPL cooperation commitment and sort of talk about sort of where this fits into the bigger picture. So, uh, so FOSS licenses as shared resources. So if you weren't here last year or you weren't in, um, Edinburgh last week to uh, hear Richard uh, give a uh, another version of this. Um, excuse me. The basic point here is that you know there's a small number of licensed texts that we all share, we all rely upon. Um, they govern large and growing bodies of uh, of software, um, and we all depend on these texts. But they're subject to varying interpretations that require resolution. So how do we, you know, collectively govern these shared resources, right? If this is a, a resource that we all use, you know, like, uh, you know, we use, you know, like natural resources, you know, how do we govern these resources? So what if a license requires additional interpretation? You know, how do we resolve an ambiguity? How do we address changes in technology that, you know, may affect the means of packaging and delivering software that affects how a license operates? Who should have the ability to, to make decisions uh, and to answer these questions, right? Should it be sort of a troll, a copyright troll in the midst of litigation seeking monetary gain or a company seeking commercial gain uh, through strict license enforcement activities? You know, should it be a judge seeking to resolve a dispute between two parties? Or maybe we leave it to the license author to, um, to make decisions. So, we know that there are existing methods for adding new licenses, and there's criteria, there's definitions that the um, Open Source Initiative has and that uh, the Free Software Foundation has for defining open source and free software. So if there's a new license, there's a governance process for, for reviewing and considering whether this license is uh, appropriate for, uh, for adoption. But what are the options for sort of interpreting or amending existing licenses? This is what McCoy Smith had referred to as the coming constitutional crisis. 
So one option is to simply amend the text, right? But this has occurred, you know, rather infrequently. You know, here are three examples. Um, you know, how could this work in practice if uh, we wanted to adopt a process for amending texts as questions arise or as changes in technology necessitate? And then this raises questions about, you know, how would this be managed and who would manage it? You know, should the licensed author have the sole and unilateral right to decide what's appropriate and, uh, and how and when to amend the text? What's the role of licensed users? So, you know, the thousands and thousands of um, licensors who adopt these same texts, do they have a voice and how, do you, how is their voice heard? What about the role of OSI and Free Software Foundation as license approvers, should they play a larger role in license governance? So option two, you know, is to rely on individuals to publish enforcement statements. This is similar to what the, um, uh, the Linux kernel developers did. Um, so this is obviously flexible. It's easy, you don't have to get a consensus, you know, uh, licensors or companies can act unilaterally. But ultimately, you know, is it practical for answering the questions that I raised earlier? You know, do you have the risk of multiple or competing interpretations? Um, and again, if what you're trying to do is adopt a model of license governance that can get ambiguities answered in a way that supports the whole community, I'm not sure that sort of relying on this laissez-faire approach you know, ultimately is, uh, is the one to adopt. So what about sort of litigation and bringing test cases? Um, you know, is, is that an approach that, uh, that could work for interpreting what a license means if uh, there's a substantial ambiguity? And I would argue that it's not. So litigation, I think, is highly flawed in this context. You know, while it could be good for resolving disputes between two parties, you know, it's very fact specific. You know, you're relying upon two attorneys to, to brief and argue the case. Um, you know, the attorney's role is to be a zealous advocate for the client's interest in that particular case. And a particular client's interest, you know, may not align with all of the other users who use and rely upon that same license. You know, it's unpredictable, right? You have two parties, you have a judge, you know, you really don't know where it's headed. Again, is this really the model you want to rely on? And the process isn't always transparent. I mean, look what's happened in Germany, right? German courts, you know, don't have the same type of transparency that we may have here in the U.S. And ultimately, you know, court decisions are impactful. Um, so uh, I guess in my view, at least, I think this is a, a dangerous tool, uh, dangerous and blunt tool for, for license governance and not one that I would choose. So option four is, you know, vote with your feet, avoid the problem. Um, but this isn't always practical. Lots of times, you know, license decisions are made upstream. You know, you're not making a decision about whether to use a particular license. You know, you're relying on a larger ecosystem. And so uh, you can't always uh, vote in this way. And also, again, you know, thinking about the point I made earlier about developing this broader governance model for solving questions, you know, this is sort of a do-nothing approach, just avoiding the problem and I don't really see that as a solution. So which brings us to sort of option five, which um, you know, you're not gonna be surprised is sort of the one that seems most appealing. It's also one that sort of you know, seems to uh, align best with sort of you know, the values and the approach that, you know, that's taken by open source communities, which is around collaboration. So how do we collaborate around interpretation? And, um, you know, I think this is, you know, the best approach. Um, you know, again, it's how do we bring together sort of interested parties to identify issues of concern, you know, where we can, you know, together create greater clarity and predictability and enforcement, establish norms, sort of address the technology issues, agree on resolutions, uh, and act. And sort of two examples, you know, that come to mind immediately were sort of the GPL v3 drafting process, um, which was very collaborative. And then, you know, which brings me to sort of the, the third part of the presentation, which is the GPL cooperation commitment. 
Um, so I think that this has been an interesting test case to watch. So a year ago when you know, Richard and I gave the FOSS licenses as shared resources presentation, we'd been thinking about the cooperation commitment. Um, and I think the kernel developers had just announced their adoption of something similar. So let me kind of give you a little bit of history about sort of what's happened over the last year and how this has been an interesting model to observe. So what is the uh, cooperation commitment and sort of how has, uh, how did this consensus evolve? So uh, GPL, as we all know, has been the focus of most, if not all, uh, enforcement activities. But we also know that GPL compliance can present many challenges. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of compliance guides that have been developed. You know, we have an entire industry that's developed to, you know, help companies comply. So, I mean, it's challenging, um, but, you know, the GPL or GPL v2 and LGPL v2 are uncompromising in the sense that there's no opportunity to cure uh, in the event that you're in breach before the license terminates. So, you know, with no opportunity to cure, you can have a situation where, you know, a single inadvertent act of non-compliance results in license termination, um, and all of a sudden you're a copyright infringer. Um, so what the GPL cooperation commitment has done is it introduces a cure opportunity that was borrowed from GPL version 3. Um, so GPL version 3 introduced this, uh, this idea of a 30-day cure period with also a reinstatement period. And where did that go? So starting with GPL v3, um, sort of this consensus has begun to develop about how to enforce GPL version 2. Um, several years ago, the Software Freedom Conservancy and the Free Software Foundation backported this GPL v3 uh, cure into their GPL v2 enforcement um, and incorporated this as part of their principles of community-oriented enforcement. Uh, then last year, uh, October of last year, the kernel developers adopted their enforcement statement that uh, included the, um, the same concept. So we saw this at Red Hat, we saw this happening and thought this was a great idea. You know, this is a way to, again, bring greater predictability into enforcement. Uh, it was so, sort of an, an easy step. Um, and so we called up our friends at IBM and Facebook and Google and, you know, without thinking twice about it, uh, four of us within a matter of, you know, a week or two were on board and November of last year, sort of we announced uh, that we were adopting this. And in, uh, in March of 2018, uh, six more companies joined, including, um, uh, you know, SUSE, Cisco, Microsoft, HPE, SAP, uh, CA. And then over the summer, we got 16 more companies, um, I think it was 16, uh, 14 more companies to join. These are big names, right? The ones in, in blue, uh, Amazon, Intel, VMware, NEC, Toyota. Um, again, this is sort of happening. You know, some of it is David calling around and speaking to uh, many of you in the room. Uh, but then, you know, this is beginning to happen organically as well. Um, next week, we're going to make an announcement about, uh, I think it's 17 more companies who are joining. Um, again, you know, a, a lot of big names here, Alibaba, Tencent, um, Wipro. I mean, so it's not just U.S. companies. We're getting companies from around the world. We have many industries represented here. So, you know, what have we accomplished? You know, if you sort of think about, you know, this consensus that's formed, um, we have, we'll have over 42 companies that have adopted the commitment. There's also an individual commitment, and we have 250 developers who've signed their names individually. That's in addition to the 300 developers that have signed the Linux kernel enforcement statement. Um, so I think we've, uh, if you view this as a problem, we've wrapped up a lot of Linux kernel code behind this commitment. So seven of the top 10 corporate contributors have um, signed up to participate, and you know many of the large individual contributors as well. So I mean, I would argue that you know we're really well on our way to establishing a consensus around uh, how enforcement takes place. 
So the, the more interesting question is, okay, now what do we do? What does this mean? You know, is this uh, a method for thinking about how to resolve, um, you know, the big questions about license interpretation? Um, you know, what I, th I think is interesting is, you know, you looked at that list of companies, we have, you know, many substantial contributors who are now saying, you know, the GPL and interpretation and stewarding the GPL is important to me. My business depends on it. I want to be part of the solution. Uh, so how do we, how do we leverage this? You know, um, should there be other issues, you know, that we tackle now? You know, what are those issues? Um, you know, what's the right process for identifying what comes next? Um, so uh, to wrap up, I invite you to, you know, join me in that discussion. I don't know what the answer to that question is. And uh, come back next year to this conference for Chapter 4. Thank you. We might not even be done with for the day with chapter three yet, but <laughs> what I think we want to do is collect a couple of these talks because they will add up uh, to something larger, which begins to approach, I think, the answer to David's question. Um, I, what what is happening in consensus about how to make software is that we are learning that we also have consensus about how to achieve license compliance, which is part of what David is talking about. The other side of which is open chain, without which uh, I think our future would be much more bleak. So I want to ask Dave Moore to come and talk about open chain. I, I believe everybody knows, Dave, you, you just may not know how long we have been working together. Um, uh, Sun Microsystems uh, had great open source lawyers when um, the time was very young, and all of them were David Marr, if they weren't <laughs> Damien Eastwood. Um, so Dave and I started working together over, well, I think it was Java, but it could have just as well have been Solaris or all the other uh, uh, just path-breaking stuff you did. Um, and then we worked together at Juniper, and now at Qualcomm, um, where Dave is the uh, legal counsel and vice president who makes uh, open source uh, a Qualcomm thing. The, uh, the first person who wrote to me seeking to discuss the IBM Red Hat deal was Dave's boss, Don Rosenberg, my old friend, who wanted to chat about the big news of the week on Sunday. Um, Dave invented Open Chain. I know, I was there. We were sitting in a vending area at Qualcomm, and he said, why can't we use the supply chain to make license compliance automatic everywhere? And he was right. Um, Dave, why don't you tell them how the future works? Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, if I can just get my double click right. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be here again. And I would say that Evan was one of the very earliest supporters of, of Open Chain, uh, seen it as a, it was an opportunity for the industry, if you will to find a way to almost like self-regulate and find, figure out uh, a good path forward, not just to do compliance, but do compliance well and do it in a way where uh, it would actually benefit a larger ecosystem, uh, not just for corporations and enterprises, but also for the ecosystem around folks that can do consulting and education, uh, training and uh, certification. Um, so where are we now? Uh, we're at this point, you know, an, an inflection point in the uh, compliance uh, narrative, if you will, uh, where there's really no excuse anymore for an organization to not feel like they have the right tools to be able to build out a good open source compliance program. Uh, there's a whole bunch of tools here that, you know, this is just, you know, a view of it, but uh, you have Fossology. This is a tool that can, like, surface the types of attributions and the types of licenses that are buried inside of a package. Um, you have other tools as well, things like scan code. Uh, you have tools around uh, ways to store and track and manage meta information around software packages and things like Software 360 portal. Uh, those, those are things that happen sort of behind corporate firewalls, if you will. But then sort of facing the community we then sort of between, uh, so the, the interfaces between organizations, you have SPDX as the lingua franca uh, for how uh, compliance information can be transmitted in a consistent way 
between organizations. You have to do group, uh, which is a way for compliance offices to trade uh, best practices and have a good forum for communication. And on top of this, you know, if you will, is trying to weave this together uh, is, uh, is open chain. And the way that we're trying to get that done is we ask this fundamental question. Uh, how can I trust, you know, trust my, my supply chain? What are the things that I need in order to make sure that you know, provided things are being provided to me under, let's say, SPDX in a way where I can consume them well, how do I know that I can act actually not have to redo that work? And we try to answer that with three different pieces. Uh, one is we have a specification for what a open source process really needs to look like, which includes management you know, within an organization around compliance. Uh, we have a way for when you do meet that specification to conform, and we have other supporting materials. Notably, uh, there was this notion, if the people generating that compliance information were not really trained that well on open source basics, how do you actually trust that data set they create? And so we have curriculum as well. Um, but the specification, once again, it has these requirements for what a quality compliance program might look like. It's got different pieces to it, but the training piece, you know, which can also be automation, and we're kind of evolving the spec that way, but there should be also a policy, there should also be a process, so that the resulting output can be relied upon. So, the spec basically confirms that these pieces are there, but we also want to preserve flexibility so that the way that you implement uh, is not necessarily precisely dictated by the spec. There's many ways to get that objective done. And the notion here is that by having these foundational common requirements, we actually have the basis for trustworthiness. This is just a, a quick screenshot. Um, uh, when we have the sort of the uh, conformance criteria, there's a checklist. And we're not trying to be tricky. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that we ask. If you answer yes to all of them, then guess what? You conform. This is a quick screenshot of one of the slides from our curriculum materials. All this stuff is under the most permissive content license that we could find. It's uh, Creative Commons. Um, International uh, Zero license, uh, 1.0. And essentially, you know, you are absolutely free. If you want to be the hero in your company and say, guess what? I came up with a, uh, a great set of curriculum slides for, for, you know, for the company. You don't even have to tell anyone at the company where you got them. All up to you. Um, again, it's about building trust. Yeah. So, so you have a, a number of companies that, are that have donated content in this space um, and are helping to champion uh, this, this cause. You have a, a lot of purchasing power that's actually you know, commensurate here. Uh, having, having signed up Toyota uh, the year before, uh, there is, and the other companies as well, there's a lot of revenue that uh, these companies pull in. And by influencing their own supply chains, there's actually a lot of purchasing power on the upstream side that can help influence what we believe good supplier practices ought to be. A number of companies have uh, indicated that they have conformed. And we're making great progress. We have a number of partners, Moorcrofts in the UK, uh, Tube Sued in Germany, uh, respectively as a supporting law firms and certification authority. Uh, we have signed up Toshiba. Uh, th welcome Toshiba. Um, more, announcement shirts, more announcements there shortly. Uh, we've added within active community members, Microsoft and Panasonic have offered great contributions. And we are going towards a formal standardization for this. So look for that uh, as an ISO specification uh, to get approved in a couple years. We're not done yet. We're going to enhance the specification. We have gotten input that there's ways for us to frame that specification in a couple ways 
to make it a little bit more flexible to implement. Uh, we're going to expand adoption. We're going to add even more supporting tools and compliance materials to uh, help people. And then we're going to also accelerate the overall economic opportunities. So we do believe that certainly for product companies, getting compliance done well, but also efficiently and at you know, cost savings, there is a compelling value proposition there. But also we believe that the ecosystem is in, at a point where it can support uh, consulting practices, uh, training, and third-party certifiers. So we are certainly encouraging that for, uh, for the ecosystem overall. And so look for more news here, uh, but more uh, members to join the board, uh, more organizations to announce conformance, more partnerships, and uh, we're certainly not shy to uh, you know, use our procurement power, not just for enlightened self-interest, but potentially to uh, help build out uh, understanding and the importance of compliance. And please, feel free to be part of this. Thank you very much. I don't have Eben's history, but I also have now over a decade of knowing people and working in this community. Uh, those of you who know Mike Dolan, he is uh, the very supportive, doing a bunch of things at Linux Foundation. And um, but, uh, the formal bio says he's the VP of strategic programs, responsible for collaborative projects and legal programs at the Linux Foundation. He has helped form over 150 open source and open standards projects covering a wide range of technology segments. Um, everything we are talking about or hearing today, uh, Mike has had some role to play or not. And uh, <laughs> uh, how overt or covert he can tell you about that. Uh, prior to joining the Linux Foundation, uh, Mike spent eight, uh, over eight years at IBM in roles across systems. Um, he has an MBA and a JD and, um, and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics. I'm not sure if he's going to talk about all those, but he's definitely going to tell us what other interesting things he's doing at Linux Foundation and how it's contributed to building this consensus in the industry. Mike. Thanks, Mishi. Um, All right, let me get my slides up real quick. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so I think the title of session two is Peace and Dividends. What happens when peace breaks out? is kind of the theme of this session. And so I thought I'd give you a glimpse from our perspective in terms of what we're doing at the Linux Foundation. Um, there's been a lot going on, you know, in terms of new projects and things that we've been involved in. And I, I think it's important to understand sort of where all this is coming from and get an understanding of, of what happens when peace does really break out. Um, we have about 150 additional project communities in addition to the Linux kernel that we're hosting at the Linux Foundation these days. Um, roughly probably about 30,000 developers are contributing to our projects in any time of the year. In the microcosm of open source that we play in, we are a small f percentage of what's going on. If you've re read the recent GitHub Octaverse report, over 90 million projects are on GitHub now. That's up 40% from last year. They're engaging multi tens of millions of developers on a regular basis. Um, the, the scale of what's breaking out is tremendous. Uh, the Linux Foundation, you know, as a foundation, we've been growing as well. We've seen uh, a number of things going on. We've learned as things start to expand and as peace is broken out, we've learned to focus on things other than uh, the license uh, war of the day or the competitive rivalry between so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so of the day. And what we've focused on since is governance. How is, are these projects governed? What is 
good project governance? What does control mean in the sense of an open source project? Um, how do you scale engagement with developers and companies and communities? Some of which who have very different interests in why they would be participating together. And when you look at the growth of all of this going on, and it's technology by technology, as many people refer to it as a project this or project that. But the reality is we're transforming industries in many cases. We're transforming how business is done. We're transforming how the goods of tomorrow are created. And I think that's a really compelling thing to understand. Um, we've looked at you know a number of projects that come to us as proposals. Everybody has an idea of something they'd like to host at the Linux Foundation at some point, it seems. But there's there's only certain things that we look for. You know, is it an open source license? Is this truly an open openly licensed project? Is there an open technical governance around the project? Um, does somebody have a control point or something that they're trying to secure? That's not a good fit for us. Uh, there's a community of interested participants that actually want to participate with whoever is starting up this project. Uh, we look for a sustainable ecosystem, uh, commercial dependency on these things. Uh, a number of projects fail. Okay? There's multi-millions of projects, and there's probably going to be multi-million projects that fail this year or that die on the vine in GitHub because nobody's maintaining them or actively participating. Um, does that mean they were good projects or bad projects? No, but what we're looking for as a foundation is something that we can help sustain. And sustaining that requires people to be dependent on using, using the code. And then at the foundation, we're also looking at neutrally con controlled community assets, making sure that one organization or one person does not have control of where things go by means of ownership of a critical piece of the community's asset. Um, we host different types of projects. This has evolved from when I started five and a half years ago. We host projects that start off as community technical efforts where a number of organizations or developers want to get together and work on something together. And we spin up a governance charter. We make sure we write down the IP policy in terms of how contributions are uh, licensed and what your commitments and, and things are as you're contributing. And this is important because that provides the foundation for a very strong collaboration, especially when you start talking about working amongst companies, many of whom are competitors. Um, and when you start to write things down and you start to put uh, things together in a way that works, and the ecosystem, like groups here today, have all been working for decades on solving the licensing issues and the other you know, little wars that broke out, and you have peace suddenly these companies are invested in these projects in a way that they may not have been five or ten years ago even. And when they're invested in these projects, they want to make sure that these projects succeed. And how do you help the developers on these projects succeed? You give them resources, things that they can use. Number one, many of the companies who are represented here, they employ a lot of these developers. That's essential. If these companies didn't employ developers, they wouldn't be able to spend time on these projects. Um, so employment is a critical piece of this. Um, but beyond that, companies provide funding into the projects. Uh, often that goes to development resources. Um, builders uh, for projects, we're building just about, I don't know how many projects per minute at the Linux Foundation, but it's quite a bit. Um, we spin up virtual machines on clouds and that costs money and uh, the developers are, are constantly testing what they're doing and, and so they need resources for that. Sometimes they want to make people, help people know about their project. They want to market their project, give it awareness help build that commercial dependency ecosystem that then brings more developers back into the project ecosystem, which brings more patches, which brings more contributions and more beneficial bug fixes and issues about security resolved in a timely manner. These are all good things. And so there's a couple of models that we use for funding. Uh, some, you know, we'll set up a project that benefits multiple technical efforts. We'll call that an umbrella community model. Uh, sometimes it's just a funding model for one particular uh, project, but uh, either way, it's a way to put resources in the hands of the developer community that's working on these things. And this has led to growth. Uh, we are not unlike GitHub. We have, we have seen a very high growth and demand in terms of hosting projects at the foundation. Uh, this is not just our uh, you know, ability to do this. It's just a, a result of what's been going on in terms of opening up collaboration in the industry. And when I sit back and I think, what has really accelerated this growth? Some of that would have naturally happened. I think that part of it is that in a model where you have a neutral, frictionless access to participate and anyone can participate, 
uh, a lot of opportunities open up. If you look at some of you know the ways tra traditional cross collaboration between companies and organizations happen in standards organizations, for example, you had to sign a membership agreement, you had to go through a lengthy process internally to get approval to participate, only certain people could participate. Our projects are completely open to anyone at any point in time to give a contribution and work in the technical community. You can earn a committer role or a seat at the table in terms of making decisions about where the where the project code base goes by making, uh, we call it a duocracy in terms of the people who do the work make the decisions. Um, but, you know, this is not something that's, a, you know, bound to, uh, you, you're only bound by the IP policy of contributing. And when the ecosystem around open source and all the lawyers here and those who aren't here today and those who were working on this 10 years ago, when they figured out how to make the IP model for open source work and come to agreement on some of the basics, it opened up this frictionless access in a much bigger way. Um, and I think we're seeing the, the dividends of that, uh, to use a phrase from the session title. But when we look at um, enabling companies to also uh, support these communities without pay to play is one of the key principles of what we do. When we set an open source project up that has funding attached to it, that's just a set of companies who are agreeing, we're going to contribute some resources and the developers are still going to go do what they do and we're not going to be able to tell them what to do. Uh, at no point can you buy a patch or buy the ability to influence a patch or buy a feature or tell developers what to do. Uh, that's just not how open source works. We understand that. And But if you put the resources in their hands, the ability to build and test a project overnight, they, you can suddenly unlock a lot of collaboration. When you start going into the telecom ecosystem and understanding what the next generation telecom infrastructure is going to be, they can't rely on just people on GitHub just putting patches in and nobody ever testing it. They need a group model in order to test and see uh, how those patches impact the overall system. And I think what we also have seen is that a lot of these projects, a lot of these communities are evolving into ecosystems where other matters become important to them. Certifications, professional certifications, being a Kubernetes certified administrator is an extremely important role in many data center uh, employment uh, opportunities these days. Um, training millions on edX and other platforms in terms of how to get started with some of our projects. I think our introduction to Linux uh, edX module is roughly about a million people have, have signed up to take that, that training course. Uh, and then commercial dependency in this model drives sustainability, and I think that's an important piece of it. So if peace is broken out, what are some of the things that could disrupt the peace? Where you know, are some of the potential issues or concerns? You know, from my perspective, just looking at what's going on, this is Mike's opinion. This is not an official Linux Foundation statement. It's not something I've vetted with hundreds of people, but I've had many conversations about what concerns people about where things are going. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is, you know, some are trying to disrupt the IP model. You know, when lawyers 10 years ago got together in a room and a lot of smart people weighed in on how things were working, not everything was exactly written down. It's in a lot of heads. It's in heads of many of the people sitting around this room today. Um, there's a new generation coming around and they have new ideas. They have different ideas of what's valuable in terms of their contribution relative to the contributions that might be coming from others. And so we have a proliferation of disruptive licensing schemes. You can look at it in any number of ways. I think uh, we'll be talking about commons clause and things like that later and I, uh, I'll stay out of that fray. But you can look at also new models like coin-based contribution models or compensation models for developers which turn the idea of open source into this more of monetary gig economy type of model. And this gig economy is a little bit different if you really look at it. You have a bunch of individuals contributing intellectual property into something, retaining ownership, and there is no sort of corporate stalwart behind them. They're, the large companies that played a significant role in open source do bring a little bit of stability to certain aspects of what this collaboration model is based on. When work for hire is no longer how the primary development model of how developers are engaging in a project, what impact does that have? Uh, how do you react to uh, an open source dependency where this is not how most developers are contributing under? Um, then, you know, there's security. 
uh, this year I've had to respond to inquiries from the uh, U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate on uh, security and is open source secure? How is open, open source handled from a security perspective? Our response to the U.S. House of Representatives is public and you can go read it online, but the reality is what happens when uninformed regulators act in many times it might be a knee-jerk reaction, uninformed about how and why this open source development model has been successful and why we suddenly have peace. Um, if you look at some of the things that are going on around software IDs, software bill of material requirements, things like that, they may be benign. Uh, they are also easy ways for people to disrupt and, and cause issues by inserting things unknowingly into requirements. And then finally, just regulation in general. What happens when certain jurisdictions decide to change the rules? Um, if you were paying attention to some of the uh, things going on with the EU copyright directive in the last year, I think there was a number of concerns that were raised around open source and how that impacts it, in addition to many other issues with that. Um, the Free Software Foundation Europe, I'll give them credit for identifying the issue and trying to take a policy approach. But I will say the Linux Foundation, this isn't, most of this is not our battle. This is not where the Linux Foundation is going to help and where we're going to solve it. It's going to be lawyers like you, lawyers at companies, lawyers at other uh, industry efforts where policy making is a little bit more uh, of something what you do. It's not something we do. We take the projects, we help these projects grow, we provide the resources and help for them to uh, do what they need to in order to engage and collaborate in a frictionless model. But there's a number of other things out there that could potentially impact us on this front. So I just wanted to give this perspective. I was asked to talk about uh, what happens when peace breaks out, and I hope you understand that peace is a good thing. Uh, let's try to keep it peaceful and not forget some of the underlying principles that got us here and, and what works. Okay. Thank you, Mike. I, um, you might want these. No, yes, yours. All, right. so all of us, we, we're, we're now so our sight is so bad we can't even tell other people's reading glasses apart. Um, I, uh, I gather that everybody has sort of gotten to where I think this all adds up. We have um, now begun to experience what can be done when there is consensus. We can uh, converge GPL3 and GPL2, Richard and I thought, uh, more than uh, 14 years ago now that automatic termination was going to become a problem in a world of ubiquitous free software and uh, GPL3 termination was designed to eliminate a problem before it became bad but GPL3 wasn't the perfect replacement for GPL2. Now we have the ability to amend the licenses by broad community consensus and that's what David was talking about. We have the ability to make industry pay for perfect compliance. We're outsourcing to the people who have the money and the incentive and we're going to get it done. And that from the point of view of somebody who used to have to try and figure out how to get some nickels and some dimes together in order to go and deal with abating bad actors is a, an overwhelmingly positive dividend of peace. We're going to get peacekeeping paid for by the people who have armies and money and who could object to that. And, and we are going to be able to find consensus between trade association forms of project governance and nonprofit community-based forms of software project governance, which is going to allow any group of people in the world who want to make software together a range of possible ways of getting all their plumbing done for them, either by community-based organizations or by industry-based organizations as the nature of their project and the nature of their desires trends them. These things are possible because there is peace. But peace, as Mike was just saying, is the work of diplomats. Um, and I, I have just witnessed a diplomatic triumph that I want to pay particular tribute to, even though we're behind schedule and we're going to delay people's lunch and we're going to have a food fight before lunch and all of that. But still, we need a quiet moment to appreciate the peacemakers, for they are blessed. I, I don't need to introduce Keith Bergelt around here, of course, but I do wish to point out that the United States used to have a really good empire full of really good diplomats who really understood people and things 
and policy problems. And Keith Burgelt, though he, you know, he always looks like he'd never worked for the U.S. government in his life, uh, was in fact a part of the greatness of the American empire now in decline. Uh, think of us as having once possessed Keith Burgelt at the Tokyo Embassy. You can understand why, in a world where we barely have ambassadors in some important places, it's worth remembering he comes by his diplomacy honestly. Uh, I skip over his hedge fund part of his life, you know, when I think about this, because, of course, I don't care whether hedge funds have good diplomats, but, but OIN has been transformed by Keith's diplomacy, and now OIN, through Keith's diplomacy, is transforming our world. Um, so uh, Keith is one half of this enormous diplomatic triumph, and Nicola Schifano represents the other part of it here today. I, I, Nicola came on my radar because he was for years a Microsoft policy guy um, in Brussels and then in the United States. And those are the people whose batting order I used to have to keep track of. So he has no idea how much I, I thought about him back when we didn't know one another. Um, but, but, but now, uh, as the person responsible for uh, Azure IP assurance for all the customers in the world, he is, of course, a peacemaker. Uh, first a Microsoft silo peacemaker, and now part of this grand peace that brings us all together. I, I can't exactly explain what it feels like to be standing here in my conference at Columbia Law School welcoming Microsoft to FOSS peace. But you can understand how it must have felt in 1945 when people really thought that they could build a new world of liberal values and collaboration and that the rich would pay for it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm reliving the, the dreams of a generation ago. Keith, come down. Nicola, please come. And um, this is history, folks. They will watch the newsreels of this great moment of the outbreaking of peace. And all I need to say is, swords have been beaten into plowshares, and spears have been beaten into pruning hooks. And here we are to appreciate it. I give you Keith Bergelt and Nicola Schifan. I think the first time I was here was uh, before I accepted the role that I currently occupy, 11, 11 and a half years ago. Uh, coming to the event, uh, listening to people in this room speak, obviously Eben, uh, and learning about open source, having come from a different set of backgrounds, worked in technology for a long time. It was very inf informative and very, uh, uh, very confirmatory of the importance of open source, this elegant social movement that we're all participating in, the idea of self-regulation and, and self-organization. Dave talked about the, the self-regulating nature, and I think how appropriate this topic is and this union is uh, with Microsoft, uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a union with OIN necessarily. OIN is the vehicle to be able to create kind of a set of norms or code of conduct for uh, what most people accept as being uh, auth to create authenticity within the community. And, uh, and to see the evolution, the, the point that, as I, I've made this, I've had, I've spoken probably six times since this was uh, announced in the last you know, two, or th two or three weeks, but no company has made a longer journey from being the most successful proprietary software company in the world to now being a company that is arm in arm, hand in hand with uh, with other companies, to be able to uh, to be able to create products, to deliver services <clears throat> to their customers, uh, and to be able to tap into the creative vein that is open source. Uh, and you know, the title that Mike talked about, it's I think it's quite interesting that John Knowles wrote, wrote a uh, a book called Peace Breaks Out. A lot of people don't know it because they remember his famous uh, late 50s tome about Phineas and Gene, uh, a separate piece. But Peace Breaks Out was was about uh, the, the 
a generation of, of, uh, of, of boys that, that were not able to fight against fascism, were not able to fight against the artificial controls uh, that were being imposed on, on, a, on a world uh, across the sea. And uh, in some ways, this, uh, we're, we're now looking at this openness and freedom and the ability to engage all companies. And one of the most sophisticated technology companies in the world has now joined the fold. Uh, and I think that to me is significant. While I don't allow myself the emotion of euphoria, uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> just my nature, uh, I'm not good with high highs and low lows, but uh, I see this as significant clearly for, for OIN, but it's more significant for the community and incredibly significant for, uh, for Microsoft as a company because it shows their evolution and it shows the inevitability as I've always described to uh, Eric Anderson and, and his predecessor uh, it leading the IP function. Open source is inevitable for companies who want to compete effectively in a, in a hyper-competitive world uh, and, and participate in models that are, that are really essential um, to, to stay, uh, to, to deliver what your, cust your customers really want. I think it would be useful now if, if Nicola could provide kind of a sense of how this evolution's worked because this isn't something that happened last week or last month. This, is, this dialogue with OIN has really been a three-year process. Uh, it, it intensified early in the spring, but, uh, but having perspective from the inside to be able to share kind of this evolution and understand the changes inside, inside Microsoft are, I think, important to be able to elucidate. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Keith. I think it's uh, first uh, a honor to, to be here, so I, I really am grateful for, for the invitation and the, the opportunity to talk today. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's certainly a journey, and, and frankly, you know, first, it's fair to say that we are, we see you know, Microsoft and ourselves as part of the community. And, um, you know, the, this becoming part of a community has started many years ago. And um, we see OIN as kind of one milestone in that, in that journey. Uh, frankly, there were other milestones before um, the work uh, in Azure and in other places and the increasing reliance on, on Linux was certainly an, another important uh, milestone. Joining the uh, uh, Linux Foundation, not even two years ago, I think, is uh, an important milestone. Uh, you know, shipping Linux in a uh, IoT module, uh, a thing called Azure Sphere, was, I think, you know, frankly, uh, we discussed that with uh, uh, some people here yesterday. That was, at least internally, a defining moment of, um, you know, hey, that's the future, that's the present. Um, so the, I think the, you know, joining OIN is, is in a sense just a logical consequence of all these steps and of this, you know, increasing participation and reliance on, uh, on the community. Um, so, you know, I think we are here now. We, are, we kind of climbed this mountain, you know, we are at the top, uh, so to speak, uh, past this uh, big uh, hurdle, at least from a Microsoft perspective. We see ourselves deeply in that community. We see the, you know, I think the, the future of Microsoft is tightly coupled to the success of um, developers and their ability to collaborate, share innovation. And there is no, you know, really alternative for us. The uh, working with developers, I think you see that also with the, uh, the, the, the GitHub, uh, the, the work that's going to happen with GitHub, uh, ensuring that developers have uh, this ability to, to collaborate is really important. and. Um, and that's how we want to use the IP as well, to uh, actually enable that collaboration, to create this uh, uh, patent piece on these uh, community projects. That's really the, um, you know, how we see the, uh, our actions. I want to understand a little bit more about what it means from your point of view to have come into this broad church of ours. We had um, awfully sharp disagreements over the course of these decades. We were, we, we were not easy in one another's company. For us, I think, if I can speak from the point of view that was on the other side all that while, it's easy for us. We, we, we have welcomed everybody. 
everybody got here. Some people came into existence because FOSS made it possible for them to exist. Some came because they began to build devices which uh, they wanted software commoditized to put into and our dear friends at Google offered them an opportunity to get into the game without a software ante. Um, but, but never quite have we welcomed uh, someone under these conditions. Um, uh, I, I feel uh, no problem about euphoria, I just want to avoid triumphalism. I want to be modest and easygoing about this. I want not to do any crowing lest I should have to eat crow at the other side. I know what we are welcoming. We are welcoming people who used to be our adversary and whom we now are delighted to know as friends. That's a, that's a special and important feeling and it's part of why I'm a little sentimental about all this because it is a pleasure uh, to welcome an adversary as a friend. Um, from Microsoft's point of view, is this a temporary business decision based on the political realities or the political economy of the cloud? Is this heterogeneity is the model of IT today and vertical integration might be the model again tomorrow? I don't want to be in a marriage of love if this is a marriage of convenience, then I want to be convenient too. I tend to think that GitHub is the demonstration that you live in our world now and that we all are going to be good citizens of it together. That feels to me like the crucial moment in the process. But I would really like to understand Microsoft's heart a little bit. I cannot, like George W. Bush, look into the eyes of Tsar Vladimir and feel his soul. And I, I certainly don't know how the other guy feels, but I want to believe that we really met in, in some honest, honorable way here. What is it like for Microsoft to be with us? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think historically Microsoft has been a, um, a developer's company first. And the, along the way, you know, that focus has um, maybe not changed, but diminished a little bit. And I, I think now we are kind of back there. It's, uh, it's really about, you know, um, working with uh, developers. And so from that perspective, I think there's really a recognition internally that, you know, open source is the way to work with developers. And from that perspective, you know, that's why you, you hear, you know, people like uh, Satya, the CEO, saying Microsoft loves Linux. Um, it's really about this uh, change of culture around the way you engage around software you know, how you, you build software, and how also you, you basically need to share innovation um, with the broader community to not only develop faster, but also make sure that, you know, you, the innovation you share is of better quality. You know, all these um, elements which we view as, as really essential to be uh, successful in this uh, new age. And, you know, again, the... Um, as we continue to build you know, our reliance as we continue to, to enable uh, others to, to use these uh, projects, being part of OIN, being part of all these projects, you know, GPL Pledge and others, certainly there are more to come, new issues are, you know, now, now that we have kind of turned this page a little bit, I think there are new issues that we need to think about. And um, so that's uh, really what, you know, what, where we are and uh, where we want to go to really work with the, the community to solve these new issues. Many people in the room remember when their companies were in that place, right? That's not a, that's not a new story. That's, that's how many of us came to be friends, colleagues, and comrades as we are. I, it's part of why I'm not in a distressed or ironic or doubtful mood about what has happened. We have real peace here. It is based on something that we can all understand. We've been through it all got into this place by some means that felt a lot like that. Keith, what, what, what do you think this means for IBM other than the obvious fact that if Microsoft can take an OIN license, there's no entity on earth that shouldn't take an OIN license? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for, for OIN, this is not really a reboot, but it, it allows us to, to look at having accomplished a very significant goal, which is to, brought in, to bring in a company that you know, and the, really the triggering event probably for OIN's formation was the scope financing that Microsoft was doing. 
and, uh, and creating kind of more FUD within the community. And so to go from there to where we are now is, is clearly, uh, it, it's an important event. But uh, perhaps, um, not to take a contrary view from, from Evan's opening remarks, but uh, there's still more work to do. Um, there are uh, aggregators uh, on the patent side that have patents that are concerning to us, that read on the Linux system and core Linux functionality. Uh, we want to be able to uh, look at taking the OIN model and platform and working with our member companies that have funded us uh, to be able to see how we can affect a positive change there to reduce risk from patent aggregators. Then there's always the threat of copyright aggregation. Uh, I've never been individually concerned with Patrick McCarty. Um, and his behaviors, but I have been concerned about what they signify, that they lead to someone who, some people with more money, better lawyers, who can actually aggregate copyrights uh, and create potential friction within the community. I think we, it gives, the, the Microsoft signing gives us the opportunity, uh, one, to, uh, to assign companies that have been on the fence, that have been maybe hiding in plain sight, uh, previously and now are exposed because, again, as said, if they can make this journey, anyone can. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if I used to say if IBM can expose its massive patent portfolio and participate in this way, then anyone who has patents can. Uh, this just gives us another source of, of energy. And really, this the knock-on effect, or what I'm calling internally the Microsoft effect, we've already had 140 new licensees in the 12 working days since the announcement. Uh, that's a bit more than we would normally have. Um, you know, we've been averaging 80, 70 to 80 licensees a quarter for the past three years. Uh, we had done much more than that at certain points in our history, but this is the kind of exogenous force that and factor that causes us to realize that, that we need to work doubly hard to to kind of grow the community. For every one of the, the companies represented here, we're growing the community so that our responsibility is to look at every ecosystem, every project that the Linux Foundation manages, and make sure that we're including core code to protect those projects and project participants and reduce the friction that they might otherwise uh, experience. So for us, it's an opportunity for us to pivot to be able to broaden and open the aperture to be able to do more for the community to support patent non-aggression and, and more broadly IP non-aggression. And it's an opportunity for us to, to build relationships with new companies that have been on the fence. I mean, just uh, Rogers here and Alibaba just signed the OAN license. Uh, uh, Ant Financial, which is Alipay, signed the license about three or four months ago. This is not an aberration. Uh, Tencent's advised that they're signing the license in two weeks. And so the movement is really in this direction. China, we now have more licensees than we have in Japan, which is saying something because Japan is, tr is the most sophisticated open source company and the most experienced open source country in, uh, in Asia. And so the, chi the Chinese movement, neutralization of potential risks from the massive patent filing strategies that are, are being that are pro being promulgated there. there. There are lots more things for us to do, and we're gonna do it arm in arm with our member companies, with our licensees, and, and we're gonna do it arm in arm with Microsoft. And this is not just sign a license and then we don't see, see each other, we don't support each other. We wanna work with Microsoft to make sure that we can provide the benefits of our experience and guidance around, around activities and ac actions that could be taken to, to further continue this evolution that Nicola talked about uh, and to ensure that that value is created because we can draw off the knowledge and experience that Microsoft has uh, in rounding our experience in how we expand the Linux system definition, how we grow into new technology areas and much the same way that our relationship with AT&T is, is, is defining as a new licensee that, that came in earlier this year. These are critically important companies and we don't want to have them simply be part of a signatory group of companies, but rather these are companies that we do outreach with. I was just in Seattle two days ago. Uh, I think uh, uh, Nicola and, and, and I were together last week in, in Scotland. We are looking to create more glueware so that, that this relationship is one that's defining for them and defining for us going forward. 
I'm going to state an ambition about what we can build on this piece just to add to the idea that there is more work to be done. I would like us now to be able, using this broad patent piece we see before us, to assure every individual FOSS developer and every nonprofit project out there that they will not be the targets of anybody's patent aggression. This is basically true for all OIN licensees within the Linux system definition. And it is rational conduct for all the patent holders in the world now to permit that ungoverned and largely ceaseless form of innovation which is out there in individual developers, students, academic teams, and nonprofit community projects. They should have complete patent peace now. We are close. No matter whether everybody makes an OIN license or there are a few hard-bitten naysayers out there should make no difference to every individual who is learning how to program and who wants to put some of her code into something that other people use. I would like to believe that it will be quicker to get to that state of complete peace for individual developers and nonprofit projects around the world than it was for Keith to bring in Microsoft, three years, he said, three years. I, my diplomatic goal here is three years from now, every free software developer in the world will feel completely safe from the patent system. And those who benefit from patenting their technologies and monetizing their research in their projects, will, in their products, will feel completely safe in doing that because they will know that that does not interfere with their ability to gain positive returns on their research investments. That's the goal I would like to see, the peace dividend out of this wonderful peace for all the coders around the world who are the client base I have been serving for decades now. I think that's achievable because peace makes peace. Because when people behave responsibly and seek peace and seek justice for society, then you can build on top of it. That's why law school exists. All right, so lunch is being set up, which means we need to have our fight before we can have lunch. Um, thank you both very much.